Uh, thanks, Sarah. I, by the way, I just posted on the chat. If anyone wants to put any questions on, uh, just do it on the chat facility and we'll deal, uh, we'll deal with them at the end. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Matthew Hall. For those who don't know me, I've been 22 years now at King's. I do um, exclusively probate and um, land law work. Um, before I go on, by the way, I just ought to mention uh, we've got th these talks are part of a series. We've got Paul Lakin um, uh, following us on the 4th of February. He's doing a talk about a case that he recently appeared in called Face and Cunningham about fraudulent wills. And then two weeks after that, on the 18th of February, Faye, Faye Collinson is doing another talk. I don't know what her topic's going to be uh, yet. I doubt she does either. So anyway, these talks can be quite boring. I'll try and keep things as perky as possible. Um, now, just let me try and share my screen if I could. Um, right, here we go. I think I'm on the wrong slide. Just let me. Uh, right, I'm just, bear with me a second, everyone. Here we go. Right, my topic today is the removal of personal representatives. I'll deal with the following, when the problem arises, what to do in the run up to a claim, the claim itself and some, um, the procedure and so on, preparation for the hearing and the trial. And then finally, if we get time, we'll just have a look on the position on costs. So all of this um, arises against the background of the basic duties of personal representatives. Um, they're set out really nicely in section 25 of the Administration of Estates Act. And in a recent case, uh, which goes through, it's quite an interesting case, but it's not on topic for this, but it goes through the background um, to section 25. It originates in the statute of King Henry VIII. And you can still get a, um, an, an inventory and an account order from the district probate registry. And that was what was under discussion in uh, Ali and Taj, even if um, the proceedings are quite contentious. And that was what was up for decision in that case. And uh, Mr. Justice MacDonald said that the basic um, aim of Section 25 is to provide protection for a beneficiary against a lazy, negligent, recalcitrant or malign personal representative. Um, so when we talk about the basic accounting duty of a personal representative, it's important, I think, just to bear a couple of points in mind. The duty to account is not a duty necessarily to provide a set of accounts in the sense of um, a balance sheet, ledgers, profit and loss, and so on. It's a process whereby the, all the PRs just have to say what the assets were, what they've done with them, what they are now, and what distributions have taken place. And that's what Chief Master Marsh said in a, a recent case called Ball and Ball. We'll come back to Chief Master Marsh because he's doing, um, getting quite a grip on this sort of uh, case, these re removal of PR cases. And the other thing is that um, the sort of financial documents that you might need to produce under a duty to account varies very much with the context. So I dealt with a case a couple of years ago where really all that had been happening under a trust was that um, money was coming in for some way, way leave agreements on some fields, and it was a few hundred pounds a year. And my trustee, who the other side were complaining hadn't provided accounts, just said in a witness statement, I got a check for 200 quid. I paid it into my bank account and I went, I wrote a check for the other beneficiary and I went and posted it through her door every year. And that, that in essence, is providing an account um, of, of the trust affairs, which is sufficient for the purpose of the rule. Anyway, how does the problem arise? What's the, what happens in the run-up um, to one of these claims to remove a PR? I thought I'd just deal with this by reference to some common themes 
which I've drawn together um, from my experience. Um, we're just dealing first then with the first type of case. I'm trying to group these together, the long-standing hatred case. So in many cases, you've got people, um, quite often family members, who they really hate each other. And when somebody dies, when their relative dies, all of a sudden they've got to cooperate and get something done. They, uh, and you know, the problems just stem from the fact that essentially they couldn't agree on how to go and get a glass of water. Um, so in that case, there'll be a deadlock. And another case where there might be a deadlock is what I've called the appointed in circa 1953 type of case, where um, there's a, a personal representative, possibly the old family solicitor, been appointed many, many years ago, no longer up to the task, and they don't want to let go, whether out of pride uh, or because he or she feels that they're letting the test data down, possibly because they're charging fees. Then we get the sort of vexatious litigant type cases where commonly it's somebody who's either not a PR or a PR who has to share the job with another PR and simply cannot abide not being the one in control. And what this, the way this tends to break down is that they'll be asking all sorts of questions about everything and never accepting the answer. And my recent case actually involved the, the, the completion of the IHT form, the IHT 205. And of course, you have to fill that form in. The, the PRs have to cooperate on filling that form in before they can even get a grant. And it's important to remember, actually, in, in that sense, that you know, all of the information might not be available anyway. And that's made clear, actually, by the, by the revenue on, on their published material for, for those forms. So, so you, get, you do get these cases where some, you know, there's just a person who's just never happy and it just can't move forward. And then finally, um, where there are some matters for investigation, so commonly here, there might be an issue over a particular asset, or there might be a desire on behalf of, of one of the parties to see that something's investigated and where the feeling is that the PR who's in charge isn't going to do that. So typically, I know that my mum gave you 50,000 quid and that was a loan and it's not a gift, it wasn't a gift. And I want to see all the bank statements and I want to see all the documents that kind of thing. So that was, that's my brief sort of synopsis of the common types of case that you might see. In the, what are we ought to be doing in the run up to a claim? Pre-action, there's no pre-action protocol for this type of case. But what my, my main tip here, if I, if I could call it that really, is that we ought always to be trying to take the heat out of the situation. Um, peculiarly, these removal applications really do provoke very strong feelings and a lot of hostility, which is odd. I say, I'm going to say it's peculiar because really being a PR is of itself quite a troublesome and um, thankless task. But nobody likes being labelled incompetent. And there's always a link as well, or commonly there's a link to the testator and the underlying emotions that are there. And once issued, um, these cases can be really hard fought and really costly. And one of the recent cost decisions that I was looking at for this, another one of Chief, Ma Chief Master Marsh's, one side had spent £622,000 to get to trial. So we need to focus on the issues before the claim. And I, I've underlined that uh, point there. What exactly needs to be done with this estate? Um, because we need to remember that um, the order for removal that you're aiming at is not a sanction for bad, contact, bad conduct. This is not a sort of probate version of a director's disqualification. The, as we'll see when I come on to the, to the, 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 the test, the really what motivates the court to make an order is to ensure that due administration can happen. So a focus on what do we need to do and 
to put your client's case forward on the basis that pragmatically, why do we need to remove you so that that can be done? And when I say taking the heat out of the situation is important, the judge will not be impressed if he or she sees in pre-action uh, correspondence uh, the long character assassination of, well, my clients never got on with you. You've always been um, um, impossible to deal with because of X, Y, and Z. You just need to focus on what, what it is that needs to be done. And ideally, I always think that at the point of issue, you always ought to be in a position to be able to say to the judge, ultimately, if it ever gets to a trial, we have no choice but to issue because, and you say to the judge, look at this letter. We've given them every chance to deal with what we needed to deal with. We had to come to court. By the way, um, if you have one of those cases where it's a never ending request for information from the vexatious litigant type uh, of um, background, make sure that you, your client has given the requisite information before you, before you make your claim. So make sure that everything that can be dealt with has been dealt with. And of course, mediation is particularly suitable here, not only because there's a family context normally or often, and because of the risk of costs and everything, but, but also because of this, even if you get your order after a trial so that somebody's removed and, and either your client carries on or somebody else is appointed, remember that you still got to deal with the, with the other party normally because there'll be a beneficiary anyway. So in a mediation, what you can actually do is you can just focus with the other side on what you need to do to get the estate administered um, and short circuit the entire process. Just dealing very briefly then with the actual jurisdiction itself, there are two main provisions, but the reality is that you're only ever going to be going under one of them, that's section 50. Section 116 is for passing over um, pre-grant uh, um, and originally section 50 was thought to be always for um, once there'd been an appointment but in fact um, with executors you can go against them pre-grant anyway. The reason why you're going to be going under section 50 is because under section 116 there has to be special circumstances albeit in fact that um, generally speaking special circumstances will be um, <clears throat> deemed to be quite wide now anyway. And then um, the procedure is set out in CPR rule 57.13. Um, there's actually nothing to say expressly in the section in, in the CPR that you have to go under part eight. I mean, I've all, I, they've always been part eight, the ones I've done, but um, in theory, the, there's nothing to stop you going into part seven, except Chief Master Marsh in a very recent shoot, the Schumacher uh, litigation, which I'll come on to in a, in a minute, has actually said that he thinks that part eight is the appropriate um, procedural mechanism and that you shouldn't, it was, he said it was unwise in that case to have issued under part seven. Um, it may be, I suppose, that if you've got a case where there, there are going to be very difficult and controversial um, allegations and counter allegations, particularly if there's fraud, the court might order points of claim and points of, um, uh, of defence to be put in. But uh, it's, it, um, the starting point is that it's a part eight claim. And of course, that's a good thing because the, the um, um, uh, Disclosure pilot doesn't apply to part eight and cost budgeting doesn't apply in part eight. Albeit though, I suspect given what I've just said about the 622,000 pound cost bill in one of these cases, I actually think it might be sensible to have cost budgeting because it does focus people's minds um, uh, on, on each stage and everybody knows where they are when you finish. Um, Right, so what's next? Um, here he is, Chief Master Marsh. He's done a really useful summary of the principles that, um, uh, that the court takes into account. 
in the Harris and Earwicker case. Um, and just in terms of authority, that was approved by Mr. Justice Carr in a case called Heath and Heath. Um, now, really, I won't run, run through them, but the important point to note, as I've indicated already, it's the welfare of the beneficiaries rather than fault, which is the guiding principle. Um, so that's, that's the point to, to take home um, off that. Um, bear in mind as well, by the way, I, and Chief Master Marsh is the first to say this, that the, 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 it'll probably be common ground in the, in the case that you're doing, that, this, that, that, that Harris and Earwicker is the sort of test, if you like. But bear in mind that it's not a test. It's not a, it's not a statute or it, the court's discretion. All that Section 50 says is the court may, in its discretion, uh, remove. OK, so here's my um, summary of the key points that you're going to want to put in, a, in the witness statement to go with your Part 8 claim in a normal type case. Um, uh, note, by the way, that my colleague um, Richard Lander recently did one of our King's Chambers uh, Zoom sessions in the, on the property series, uh, a talk called Crap Witness Statements and How to Avoid Doing One. Um, now, this is my more slightly more tactful um, contribution. Firstly, um, I come back to my point. What is the estate? And that you actually required by um, the practice direction to part 57 to put information in about that anyway. And what steps need to be taken to ad administer it? So that's, that will be my starting point. Then, what, why is it, this is the fundamental question really, why is it that these steps will not be performed properly by the defendant? And again, please um, avoid the lengthy character assassination attempts that you see in some, some, of, some of the evidence. Thirdly, what, why would I be better if I took over myself or why is it that the substituted third party will be better at doing what needs to be done? And uh, also, if you're asking for a third party um, professional appointment um, and uh, you, the practice direction requires you to put in a consent and evidence of their suitability, don't skimp on that, by the way. Sometimes you just see there's a sort of letter written from a, a local solicitor saying, yes, I'd be happy to take this over. I think it's a good, very good idea to put in evidence of their um, qualifications, their experience, but crucially, how much is it going to cost? How much is it going to cost to get somebody else involved? And as I've said before, there is always a risk, by the way, in, in this sort of case that the, um, getting a third party in is a sort of seen as a, a, a way of cutting the Gordian knot or unlocking the dispute between the two. I, I think that's a mistake because all that ends up happening is that, that the, the substituted solicitor or, who, or whoever takes over. And then the same problems that have underlied the whole thing are continue because the, the, the two key protagonists who don't get on just continue to, 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 to create issues. And it just runs up costs where, when the, um, the third party is, the, is piggy in the middle. And then finally, so far as it's relevant, how does what you're proposing fit in with the wishes of the testator? Uh, uh, by the way, I'm using testator and administrator. I'm not being sexist, but um, I just find administratrix so difficult to say. I mean, I'm still unclear about what the plural should be. Um, how does it fit in with the wishes of the testator and with the wishes of the beneficiaries, so far as it's possible to discern? So that's my basic run through of what you ought to be concentrating on in a witness statement for one of these cases. Dealing then with the, the way that you're going to resolve this at a hearing or a trial. Chief Master Marsh um, is very much of the view that these cases should not necessarily be going forward to a full trial with cross-examination of witnesses. In fact, he said in the Schumacher case, um, that, that is referred to there with the reference, uh, that um, 
cross-examination of witnesses at a full trial should be the exception rather than the rule. Uh, now, it's easy to see why in the context of that case, uh, and in probably the sort of cases that are coming in front of Chief Master Marsh, that that should be the case. Schumacher is about the estate of um, the world-renowned architect, Zaha Hadid, uh, the queen of the curve, she's referred to as, uh, and she must have been doing something right because her estate is worth 67 million uh, quid odd. Uh, and there's all sorts of issues about it. What happened uh, in the report, report of the case that you see there, the, the procedural hearing that's the subject of this report, is that uh, one side wanted to have an eight day full trial in front of a high court judge on a removal application uh, with full cross-examination. And that, that submission was unsuccessful. Uh, just as a really good dictum here um, from Chief Master Marsh, it's essential for the court to avoid as far as possible providing a forum for the parties merely to vent their complaints about each other. Again, the, the jurisdiction is prospective. It's to do with how to sort things out. It's not retrospective to do with blame necessarily. Blame is only relevant insofar as it's damaged the estate. So somebody's obviously got to be removed or it's um, or where and, and it creates hostility, but only where the hostility is preventing the estate from being administered properly. So, um, so, so that's where that's Chief Master Marsh's view on on that and the sort of cases that are being de dealt with by the masters in the High Court uh, in the Rolls Building. I have to say, all of the cases that I've done, including a couple in um, in the High Court in London, have been done with cross examination. Um, probably because they're the sort of cases that you can sort of get, you know, could do within a reasonable time anyway. There are disadvantages to this way of doing it. Um, principally, um, it's to do with the, the organisation before the trial of what it is that you're going to have evidence on and how you're going to deal with disputed issues of fact. Um, Chief Master Marsh seems to be of the view that all the judge really has to do when there are disputes of fact is to take note of them almost as something where there's a reasonable, arguable case, almost like a summary judgment or reverse summary judgment test and proceed on that basis. I have to say, I think that, is, that does give the advocate some headaches really. As far as my clients are concerned, if they've when I've dealt with them, if there's been an accusation against them of some terribly unreasonable conduct, and they say to me, well, um, Matthew, I, I didn't do it. That just didn't happen. Uh, and the other side say that it did happen and they want to rely on it as grounds for removal. Then ultimately, it seems to me either it did happen, in which case it's taken into account, or it didn't, in which case it's not taken into account. It's difficult in, in my opinion to see how you can just sort of leave it hanging in the air well it might have happened and it might not um, it's true um, that not all factual issues need to be explored you, you don't want to be going through the history right back to the childhood fight that I showed you in the photograph um, you know but at the same time um, how do you know in advance which of the things that might require cross-examination and which might not? So um, whilst it's clear um, um, to see what motivates um, Chief Master Marsh's approach, it, it does give rise to some serious considerations in terms of trial preparation. And so here's my sort of tip really tips to, to how you're gonna to have to deal with this. If you have got someone that's coming up for what looks like it's going to be a big um, bun fight or battle royale as Chief Master Marsh called it in the Schumacher case, you're gonna to have to have a PTR and sort out once and for all what you're dealing with in terms of um, 
disputed evidence, live evidence, and what you're not. And I would think, and in fact, it, it, this was done in Schumacher, and it eventually led to, the, to, to a partial resolution of that part of the case, that you're going to have, a, have to have an agreed list of factual issues which are in dispute, with each side saying whether they want to have cross-examination um, or not on that particular point. So you're going to have to whittle things down. And that's going to be quite a bit of work in, in advance of a PTR. It seems to me really that that's the only way that, that sensibly it can be done, because otherwise you're going to be going into a trial not knowing what it is that you're going to be challenging in terms of live evidence and what you're not. Um, but it's always useful anyway, of course, to focus, focus on, on that sort of matter. So, um, so that's, the, that's dealt with the procedure and the run up to trial and how the trial's likely to be done. It'll be in Manchester, a district judge normally in uh, London, even the really big cases like uh, the Schumacher case are being dealt with by the masters down there. Finally, just then on uh, the costs. Um, don't just assume uh, that costs are going to come out of the estate. That's the first thing. Uh, neither should one assume that the basic rule of costs in, uh, in ordinary litigation applies either. Um, because th there are some distinct provisions, which I'll just put on the screen in a minute, which stem from the law's historical, uh, the judge's historical indulgence towards trustees and personal representatives. Um, recognising as, as they do that um, most personal representatives and trustees are lay people who are acting um, gratuitously. Um, uh, the, the, the law has allowed them quite a bit of slack. So you can see that in the part of Sir George Jessel MR's dictum that I've just put in bold there. Um, but it, what he said was that mere neglect probably isn't going to be enough. Um, and he said, in this case, I find inexcusable delay. Now, it shouldn't be thought, of, notwithstanding this, that there is some sort of test of inexcusable conduct before um, a PR who um, is guilty of causing a claim to have to be made and then fighting the claim before that PR has to pay the costs. The basic starting point is the ordinary starting point uh, on inter partes costs. So the court's got a general discretion as to whether to make any order at all. And then there's the normal general rule that the loser pays the winner's costs. Then the court moves on to the special provision, which is in rule 46.3 and the practice directions rule 46 about the trustee's indemnity or the PR's indemnity. So it's a two stage process. Firstly, who has to pay the other side's costs, if, if anyone? And secondly, does, the, does your tr PR get to get, to get uh, the costs paid out of the estate? Um, the be as a basic proposition, I would say this. If you've got somebody who's been really unreasonable and then you've set them up nicely and said, look, come on, we need to sort this out. Otherwise, we're going to have to make a claim you make the claim and then they resist it and go all the way to trial and fight it tooth and nail, the likelihood is they're going to have to pay your costs and that they will not get the indemnity from the estate to do so or for their own costs. Um, there's a good um, little um, um, example case, um, a, a recent one, another one of Chief uh, Master Marsh's called Long and Rodman. If you just want to sort of see how the, pro the, the progression of the reasoning works um, after one of these cases has, has gone to court. In that case, it was fought tooth and nail by both sides. Really, I think it's the one where the 622,000 pounds was spent actually. Um, neither side got exactly what they wanted. Chief Master Marsh said, right, I'm not making a cost, uh, a cost order in favour of either of you. It's no order as to cost. And the PR who resisted um, the claim um, and fought it tooth and nail was deprived of his indemnity. Right, I think that's me 
uh, that's me done. Are there any questions on the chat, Sarah? Oh, you're yes, muted. there's been um, a, a couple of questions, one of which was with regards to the, um, the witness statement from, um, uh, sorry, was with regards to the consent authority point that you were talking about, Matthew. My, my answer on the chat was that I generally do a witness statement from the person you're proposing to appoint to say that they're content to do it and to provide some evidence of their suitability at yeah. that cost. But there was no firm rules and therefore you could do it within the client's witness statement uh, and that I would get you to email if you disagreed. Yeah, great. That's yeah. <laughs> and the second question <laughs> then was what about what about leads? Are they being are they being heard by DJs um, or are they um, being heard by circuit judges? What sorry these these leads. cases? Yeah, yeah. I think you'd said it in Manchester. We we have our oh sorry yeah no DJs. leads yeah very much very like very likely a DJ yeah. And uh, there's a final question. Would you include all pre-action correspondence in the client's witness statement if you act for the beneficiaries to get the exec removal who don't get on, can't agree to anything, or just a selection of the correspondence to keep the focus? Selection. And also, by the way, one of the things that I do, I do see a lot is that where a witness statement is drafted um, professionally, there's a tendency to sort of tell the whole story through the lens of the correspondence. And whilst it's obviously quite a convenient way of setting things out, um, because you're going through your file and sort of doing it and looking at see what's happened, it can, I think, um, lead to a, a, some, a sort of, it can lead to a sort of a, um, things being set, told rather second hand. So I think you need to be careful about correspondence. I think, for, for example, I had a, I had a, a, a property dispute just um, in September and quite a lot of the evidence was sort of, well, on such and such a date, I wrote to the council saying this and then I wrote to my solicitors saying this. And it, I think you just need to sort of, I mean, if you're doing one, I, by the way, I think it should be um, from the client the statement, not from the solicitor. And in fact, Chief Master Marsh has said that in one of the cases I was reading. Um, and I think very much you just want to sort of focus on the key problems that have led to the claim being made. Uh, at Richard's, Richard's talk, by the way, despite its title of crap witness statements, is actually really good. I watched it. Um, it's, um, it's, quite, it's quite entertaining and it, um, you know, there's, there's some really good stuff in there. Okay. Um, is that, are we done? Is that it? Anyone else? No? Okay, well, thank you ever so much, everybody, for joining us. Um, and I gave some dates out uh, before. So with that, we'll say um, goodbye. The classic Zoom wave. Yeah. Wave. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks, everyone. <laughs>